Welcome back. I said I would begin now to deep into this work and to explore certain aspects of it. So what I want to do in this session is explore two aspects of stanza one. That is, the flame itself, what the flame is, and then the deepest centre. Two aspects I've already mentioned, but we need to go a little bit further into it, just to get a sense of what is involved here. I'll just re begin with how he opens this commentary. The soul now feels that it is all inflamed in the divine union. Its palate is all bathed in glory and love. That in the intimate part of its substance, it is flooded with no less than rivers of glory, abounding in delights, and from its depths flow rivers of living water, which the Son of God declared will rise up in such souls. It seems, because it is so forcibly transformed in God, so sublimely possessed by him, and arrayed with such rich gifts and virtues that is singularly close to beatitude, so close that only a thin veil separates it. So that paragraph is, is one could say, a sort of a summary of this whole work. In that place where, on the one hand, there is only a, a thin veil separating from eternal life. But on the other hand, the person is living the fullness of life here in this world. And that's brought about by the flame. And this flame does many different, right throughout the whole of this work, we have the flame doing all sorts of different things. But primarily, here at the beginning, what everything the flame does is somehow contained in this word glory. It's a word that holds all of what the flame does. And the soul sees that every time the delicate flame of love burning within assails it, it does so as though glorifying it with gentle and powerful glory. Such is the glory this flame of love imparts that each time it absorbs and attacks, it seems it is about to give eternal life and tear the veil of mortal life, that little is lacking, and that because of this lack, the soul does not receive eternal glory completely. So we have this flame that absorbs and attacks us. Their words that somehow say something of the human experience of this flame. What the flame is in reality doing is imparting love. It's always imparting love, however it is experienced. So... On the one hand, it is the sort of the thin veil, the eternal life. On the other hand, the person is living 
very strong desires. There isn't a sense of fulfillment here. There's desi ardent desire, we're told. The soul tells the flame, the Holy Spirit, to tear the veil of this mar. That's the end of the first step. Tear the veil. So there's, on the one hand, person is on, at a spiritual level, because they're experiencing God so strongly and so profoundly, there's only a thin veil. Yet at the same time, the person is living this fullness of desire for God. Because that cannot, that what cannot be fulfilled in this life. And so, to come to this flame, the flame is the Holy Spirit. So I've already mentioned that. That sort of, just, and the work is the work of the Holy Spirit. And in this first stanza, the soul is praying to this Holy Spirit. Or the way he puts it, it intimates and stresses its tremendous desire. Persuading love to set it free, disentangle it, let it be free. Just the Holy Spirit at work in the person. This flame, every time it flares up, bathes the soul in glory and refreshes it with a quality of divine life. So what happens then? What is this flame doing? That the soul is reaching out to here. I just pick out a few things here. It makes the person love most sublimely. Very that that's the, you use a very strong word. John uses a very strong terminology here. The the kind of love that this flame, when it has done its work, makes the capacity for love that the person has. I'll just read how it is put here. Such is the activity of the Holy Spirit in the soul transformed in love. The interior acts he produces shoot up flames, but they are acts of inflamed love, in which the will of the soul united with the flame made one with it loves most sublime, yeah, very sublime. Yeah. But it is the Holy Spirit doing this with him. The fire has taken over. The log of wood has been completely taken into this fire. And so now it is giving out fire, a most sublime love, a love that is in some way touches upon God's love. So the flame enables or allows or sets the person free or whatever words we want to use to love in this sublime way. The second thing I would pick out here that the flame does, it, I'll put it like this, it transforms how the person hears God. And the illustration that John gives here to illustrate this is 
little passage from John's Gospel, chapter 6 of John's Gospel. And as you go through chapter 6 of John's Gospel, which is principally on the Eucharist, the words of Jesus become more sublime as it goes on. But less and less people stay with Jesus. And the more sublime the words of Jesus become, the more people that reject them turn against them. But what the Holy Spirit does here, it transforms the way that the person hears, that the person is able to hear the true word of God. It's the Spirit that enables this. That these words are perceived by souls who have ears to hear them. Those souls, as I say, who are cleansed and enamored. Those who have been purified by this fire and, and love has been set alight in them. They're able to hear the word of God. The language, he said, the language and the words of God speaks in the souls. So they're able to hear the word of God. John goes on to clarify this. Those who do not relish this language of God, sorry, those who do not relish this language God speaks within them must not think on this account that others do not taste it. The person cannot understand it. These are the words, but they're not words that are heard. It is the, the presence of God within. Just, obviously, it is not words in any vocal sense of words. It is it's this deep presence of the Spirit. God is heard in a new, in a much deeper and newer way. So God is heard. The third point I would pick out here from this, the flame. I'll just read a little bit here first and I'll make a few comments on it. Thus this flame is living. Not because the flame is not always living, but because of its effect. It makes the soul live in God spiritually and experience the life of God. The spirit and the senses transformed in God enjoy him in a living way. The word living is very important in this first line of the poem. Or flame of living love, or love that is alive, love that is filled with life, love that is brought to life by God. The whole experience of God here, and this whole work, is of a living God. And living in two ways. It was living within the person, and bringing the person to life. The life that the person lives is the life of God. And indeed it becomes the one life. It is really the one life. It's the life of God living within. That's what the person is living from. And while perhaps we can, we can kind of accept this at some sort of theoretical way, or if some wonderful book or document or theologian tells us this, we might accept it. But actually accepting it in the reality of our lives is very challenging. As this is this is a God, this is a God that one can no longer put in a place or define in a particular way or see according to any kind anything we have been taught or this is 
This is a God that is much more profoundly personal and deeply interwoven or integrated into the life that a person is living. Or indeed, one needs to go further with that and say that the very life that the person is living is the life of God. And the difficulty with that, of course, from a, a human perspective, is that often we can kind of find ourselves like we're like in water with nothing to hold on to. Where, where, where's God here in this? But, God, but of course, the reality is that God is like the air that we're breathing. We don't see it, or we're, we, 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 we have little or any awareness is there, but. It's so hidden. But air is probably even not the right. There's something even more hidden than that. Transparent than that. So this living here is a very important concept that John is drawing our attention to. Here. Everything about this God is living. This God and God living within us. So, like this fire is constantly changing, evolving, adapting, and, but always elusive. It's a power. So, so this flame of love that's alive, this living God, as John tells us here, it's nothing less than a glimpse of eternity. But of course we can't in any way take that in to our human, with our human limitations. So there are just a few aspects of this flame that's the Holy Spirit. That is active, operating, transforming, cleansing in the deepest center. At the deepest center is the place where everything in this work takes place. That's because that's where God is and that's where we are. That's where the deepest truth about ourselves is, at the deepest center. And again, like everything else, John struggles to explain this. What is it? Where is it? Because none of our usual words in a, in take us there. Even soul or spirit. Or yes, yes, but. And, and of course, we're not real, it is not actually a place <coughs> in any sense that we understand what a place is. It is something much bigger than that. Okay, let, let's hear a little bit of what he's talking about. <coughs> this feast, this festival, I said everybody here is a festival, celebration, takes place in the substance of the soul. This is what John's trying to find language here, the substance of the soul, somewhere. Where neither the center of the senses nor the devil can reach. So it is a place where the center of the senses, I mean, that's just another term, what does he mean by that? What he's trying to say there is that nothing that can be perceived by our senses can reach this place within us. Nothing. Either the external senses or the interior senses, the psych, he wouldn't have that word of course, but no, nothing, emotions, anything can reach this place within us. Neither can the devil, neither can evil, neither can any other external force other than God. Can reach here. 
So it is somewhere there. And because of this, therefore, the more interior it is, the more secure, substantial, and delightful. So as nothing else can get in there, therefore nothing can disturb this. But it's also substantial as real and delightful. Because the more interior it is, the purer it is. <coughs> and the greater the purity, the more abundantly, frequently, and generously God communicates himself. Because clearly, if nothing can get in there, nothing can disturb or interrupt or compromise God's communicating. Okay. But John goes on. Thus the delight and joy of the soul is so much more intense because God is the doer of all without the soul doing anything itself. Soul cannot do any work of its own because anything, the soul, the person, even the greatest depths that we, the person can reach themselves, they can only operate with the senses, with what is human. And there's nothing human here. So the person's sole occupation, is said, is to receive from God. Who alone can move the soul and do his work in its depths? So, this is the place deep within where only God can work. Nothing that the person does themselves can in any way reach this place within, that only God. But when God has works there, everything, the whole person, is changed, transformed by it. And so everything here is about receiving. And that requires a great level of humility. The letting go. Because there's always the human inclination to want to do a bit, want to control, want to know, want to have power, want to be involved want this in some way to be mine, to possess it. All of those tendencies have been purified by the flame. Therefore, the person now has the freedom and the openness and the humility and whatever to receive what God is giving them from within. And so it is from the deepest center we could say that the true self is born. The person is set free and becomes alive. Since by saying that the flame wounds in its deepest center, the soul indicates that it has other, less profound centers. So, John, we won't, we won't go into that. There are deeper, and so he is struggling all the time to try and tell us that this is deeper than anything that we can imagine or think about in any way. This is Spartan. But what is it? On the one hand, yes, it is the deepest and truest dimension of us as people, as human beings, as creatures made in the image and likeness of God. But it is also, and much more importantly, he tells us, the soul's center is God. It's not just where God is in some kind of spatial sense, but it is God.
That's a very strong term. I, it's not, it doesn't mean that somehow or other we become part of God or absorbed into God. That's not what it is. But it is God. And let's, let's let John explain a little bit what he means. When it, that's the soul, the person, the deepest centre of the person, has reached God with all the capacity of its being and the strength of its operation and inclination, it will have attained its final and deepest centre in God. It will know, love and enjoy God with all its minds will know, love and enjoy God with all its strength, all its ability. It is in terms of relationship. It's become one with God. All its being and the strength of its operation, everything is now at one with God. And so on the one hand, the person here is living and operating from there. On the other hand, the person really doesn't reach its deepest centre until the next life. He said it can always go deeper into God. It's always further to be gone. So... To give us a sense of what's meant here. It said, love is the inclination, strength and power for the soul in making its way to God. For love unites it with God. The more degrees of love it has, the more deeply it enters into God and centers itself in him. We can say that there are many centers in God possible to the soul, each one deeper than the other, as there are degrees of love of God possible to it. So, see what's going on here. The deepest center of the person, now he's talking about the deepest center of God. A weak person, so, it's going deeper into the person, going to, and actually they're the one reality. <coughs> Very difficult for us to logically work this out in our heads in any sort of human way but that's as it's experienced that's the experience that is the reality because the depths of the relationship that is made possible by the trinity that lives within a person that's what john is trying here to he's at the he's at the very edges of language here at the very edges of ideas or images that we can come up with to try and explain this. Is God in the deepest, deepest, deepest center of the human being, wherever that is, deeper than anything that anything else can reach? And he is God, I say, is the person going deeper and deeper into God? Yet, it is the same reality that he's speaking about. It's not two separate journeys or two separate places, but the one reality, the one action of the flame here. And it is always the carrying through, the, we might say, the logical consequences of what Jesus says in the Gospel. How Jesus describes his, relation, his relationship with the Father and the relationship that he and the Father, the Trinity, desire, want, wish, long to have with us. Dwell in us and we dwell in him. And so what John is attempting to do here is to say to us, yes, this is real. It's not out there somewhere but is real in you and you and you and you and me and all of us.
and all brought about by this flame. So this deep ascent, or then, let's well, finish now in a moment because we need it. Hence, for the soul to be in its centre, which is God, as we have said, it is sufficient for it to possess one degree of love, for by one degree alone it is united with him through grace. So one little bit of love is enough to be there. Should have two degrees, it becomes united and concentrated in God in another deeper. So any little bit of love <coughs> unites one with God. So there's deeper and deeper centers. So but any little bit at all unites one with God. Because God is love. So even the slightest bit of love that anybody has unites it with God. But we go to a deeper set and a deeper and a deeper one. Should it have three, it centers itself in a third. And so but here now, when someone has the final degree, has got millions or whatever, whatever, he doesn't say how many, God's love has arrived at wounding the soul in its ultimate and deepest center. No, it is the ultimate and deepest center. Which is to illuminate and transform it in its whole being, power and strength and according to its capacity, until it appears to be God. Just think about that sentence for a moment. This whole being, power and strength. There's an echo there of a very famous line in the scriptures, in the book of Deuteronomy, the famous command of God to Israel. You should love the Lord your God with all your how strength, all your mind, heart, strength, however it goes, I remember it takes mind, heart, strength. And in John de Cross's other work, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, John tells us there that in that line is contained everything he would want to teach the spiritual person. there to the people of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy God gave the one command I am the Lord your God you shall love with all your mind, heart, soul, strength that's the command which summarizes everything of the call of the people of Israel to be <coughs> God's people and John says in that is contained everything he would want to teach <coughs> And so we have the echo, though he doesn't refer to it here, the words are virtually identical. That's, what, that's what's happened here. That's what he's speaking about. It's the fulfillment of that commandment. The fulfillment of the commandment that's at the heart of the scriptures. And that Jesus in the gospel picks out as being the most important commandments. And he then adds one from Leviticus to love one's neighbours, oneself. But that is implied in the Deuteronomy one. Because if one loves God with all one's power and strength and being, as John the Cross is showing us here, then the flame goes out, the loving as God loves. The world, creation, everything as God loves from, because it's coming from, and they're living from the deepest centre, which is God. Okay, we leave it like that because we're going to take a little bit of a break before Mass. Come back in the afternoon at is it 4 or 4.30, 4 30 we come back at. And I'll pick out a few other things from, I'm just dipping in as we see it.